where did we leave off on Aristotle? Actuality, we could do a quick review. Actuality goes with what? What, what word or concept? Actuality is being. Potency is, okay. And form is associated with being an actuality. Matter is always in a state of potency and becoming or potentially malleable into something else. What was the definition we gave for change? The actualization of... Guys, order in the court. That's right, actuality of potency. And so that explains how things can change is to go from a potential tree to an actual tree. That's a process of change. And so you can use the Aristotelian concepts of the actualization of some potency or the movement of potency to its actualization is the precise notion of change. We talked about substance. Substance in kind of common vernacular could just be translated as thing or real thing. And Plato and Aristotle, we discussed last lecture, differ on their concept of substance insofar as where it exists or what, what are real things. So Plato's going to say forms are true substances that exist transcendent outside of the material world in the Platonic heavens. And Aristotle is going to say, no, they exist within matter. And we also made a distinction between Aristotle's notion of primary and secondary substance. So substance, real thing in the most definite sense, is anything particular, material that you could bring in. Secondary substance would be the idea of tree. That tree that I'm pointing at is a primary substance, and tree or treeness is secondary. We also talked about, for Aristotle, form answers the question, well, what is this? And what makes it a this and not simply just a heap of parts? And we talked about that it's form. It's form that brings all the parts into unity. And the higher you climb up from just inanimate matter to living matter to living beings, that principle of unity becomes even more. We also talked about that for Aristotle, there are substantial forms, which are essential, meaning you can't take away some property, remember three-sidedness three of a triangle, and still have a be a triangle. Therefore, three-sidedness is part of the essential form, the substantial form. Whereas accidental would be like colors, shapes, size. Eidos, the Greek word for form. For Aristotle, that is the definition of the essence of something. Now Aristotle gives, how do you find the essential definition of something? Locate its genus. Genus is a genre, the general category. Now you don't want to get so general that you just say, well, what is it, stuff? It's just stuff. It's, well, so get, get a bit more precise. So let's do an example. Let's try to define this and give the essential definition of a human being. So that which 
is common to us all and you can't take away without destroying what it is to be a human being, without losing the very essence of a human being. So let's first go into the general category of what we not only just share among us, but all our class. What would we're all considered to be what? It starts with an A. Animals. That is your genus. Then Aristotle says, once you locate the general category, the genus, then find what makes in this class, because there's a lot of different types of animals, what makes us in the animal category different from the rest, or specifically different? Get, get, getting close. Uh, so notice specific difference sounds like what? Species. That's where we get, you get genus species and you get the essential definition. Okay, so there's a, we don't want to list just accidental. There's a famous joke that somebody in Plato's Academy said, um, man, human being, uh, a featherless biped. Well, look at we're featherless and we're bipeds. So somebody said, thinking that's a bad definition takes a chicken that's plucked, puts a sign around it saying featherless biped, uh, biped equals man and throws it over the, the university as kind of a joke over the wall. And to illustrate the point that, well, man, we got a bad definition here because now we're including these things, um, which are also featherless bipeds. So something that's specifically unique to us that no other animal has. You already said it. Do they, like, shave their feathers off or, like, do they pluck them off? I think you pluck chickens. Does it hurt them? Uh, once they're dead, it probably doesn't hurt them. Oh, that was a dead chicken? I, I imagine it was. <laughs> uh, uh, otherwise, it would get pretty... Nasty trying to pluck a living chicken. Yeah. So you said it. Now, let me put it this way. Animals do have intelligence, but they don't. I mean, a, a lot of animals have intelligence, but there's a specific type of intelligence. Reason. Rationality. So put these two together. What is a human being? Traditionally conceived and defined a rational animal. And we'll talk about, well, what's the difference between rationality and intelligence? Anybody have an idea? Could be, but don't animals... Aristotle says, um, he gives an analogy for how our perception and knowledge works. Now he says, before you ever think anything, your mind is a blank slate. Now you might remember this in the, the reading that I gave you on Aristotle. It's called the potential intellect. And unlike Plato, who says, your mind has all the forms. You know everything you've just forgotten and therefore need to recollect. Aristotle is going to say, before you think and experience the world through your senses, your mind is a tabula rasa. What's a tabula rasa? Blank slate. Let me give you some... important philosophy words. A priori versus a posteriori. How many people have ever heard of those terms? What's a priori mean? The key is prior. Prior to what? So isn't that like information gathered by the experience? Yes, good, good, good. Concerning knowledge, you can have knowledge that's either a priori or a posteriori. A priori knowledge is prior, before, 
or not dependent upon sense experience. Uh, an illustration with that traditionally would be conceived as mathematics that we really can figure out that on a right angle triangle that the areas on the squares of the sides of a right angle triangle is equal to the area of the square on the hypotenuse. And I don't ever have to sense a triangle to know that. It might help to diagram and draw that up because abstract ideas are difficult to grasp and that's why we try to do diagrams and draw things out. But the truth of those conclusion mathematical propositions are not dependent upon your senses. They follow from definitions. Once you define your science, you lay out your axioms, you can derive all the proofs and conclusions a priori. A posteriori, just the opposite. What do you think a posteriori means then? after or dependent upon sense experience. Plato believes that all knowledge is a priori. Why? Because you have it prior to sensing anything. You just need to recollect it. In fact, he would believe your senses simply just cloud your knowledge and your ability to know things. So you want to stay in the abstract realm. Aristotle, do you think he believes knowledge is a priori or a posteriori? A posteriori. So that's why he says, before you sense anything, your mind has nothing written on it. It's a blank slate. Now remember, Form is what makes something be what it is. So I could take a gold bullion cube. That in a superficial sense has the form of a bullion cube block. Now what if I melt that down and I take the matter and I form it into something else, perhaps a signet ring with an S on it, S-shaped. Then Aristotle says, conceive of the mind like a blank slate, like a wax tablet. What is sense perception like? It's like this. It's the world pressing in on you. And that's no different than what modern science tells us. Those are sound waves, percussions, and they're traveling through the, the air, and then what do they do? They hit your ears. And information, which, very interesting, what word do you see in there? Information. Form. Form. The idea is in the matter. Traveling hits your matter, and then you get the information or the form or idea into your mind. Light is the same way. Light waves are hitting and they hit your eyes and you're able to get forms or information in that way. Information in by touching, smelling, all the senses. So what perception is and sensation, it's the world pressing in on you. Now watch what happens. If I take the signet ring and I press it in on the piece of wax, what's left? An imprint. Is the gold left or is the form left? Is the matter imprinted on the wax or the form? The form without the matter. And these, here's a question. Is this a copy of the form or is it the same form that's now on your mind, in your mind? It's a copy. 
Uh, what's a copy? Is there a difference between the original and a copy? What's the difference? You have to find a difference. Find it. So let's ask this. Yeah, is this a diff in a different form than? Remember, form is what forms matter. Is this form any different? Can you find any difference? Yes. What? Well, that's the, now you're talking about the matter, the difference in the matter. But is there a difference in the form? No. Now you're talking about the matter. So what's really interesting is that there is only one form of roundness. It's an archetype. Remember in the platonic sense? So let's say I want to construct a table that's round. I don't make a copy of the form. I put the form into the matter. And what's really nice about that, I never actually end up using up the form. It's not like, oh man, we've got half the form left. We better be very careful um, what we're going to form next. Why? Because what diminishes is not form. It's immaterial. What diminishes is matter. This brings up some interesting stuff about copyrights um, and co copyright law that I won't get into right now. But So why do I bring this up, this question of, is this a copy or is it the identical form? Because in the moderns, in modernity, they break away and reject Aristotle. And so their notion of what an idea is, eidos, is a copy. So when I think about a car and have the idea of the car, they would say that, oh, that is kind of like a copy or a picture that you paint in your mind. It's isomorphic with the reality of that, but they're not identical. Your idea is not the same thing as the car. Watch this with Aristotle. The form that forms that gold, the eidos, into the s shape is absolutely identical. There's nothing different. So there is, according to Aristotle, and this is why he says, the mind is potentially all things. That when you come to know something, you don't picture or paint an image in your mind. You have the actual thing in your mind. And there's a communion with reality where modernity is marked by there's a separation. Man, the human beings and the subject is separated from reality. And they have to kind of look at it and make their own ideas and try to map that onto the world. But Aristotle says that when you come to know the world, you become the world without the matter. Thank God, because every time you would think something. Imagine if I thought house my mind would mold into a house. So there's something really interesting about the potential intellect that we can liken to a wax tablet. It is potentially all things in the universe. In what way? Aristotle would say, well, in reality, it's being, it's form without the matter. Because remember, matter doesn't make something real. It's the form that makes matter real. And so... The potential intellect is capable of being pressed in on and receiving the form without the matter and not a copy of the form, the exact same form. And therefore, what knowledge is, according to Aristotle, is identity and communion. But that's still not enough for knowledge because obviously me pushing a ring on a wax tablet the wax tablet's not saying, thank you, now I know. It's not intelligent. Okay, now I know it's an analogy. But when I say that the circle whoops, is red, 
you have to understand how much is involved in making a predication that appears as simple as that. And this is going to explain, let's take a, one of our closest relatives, one of the most intelligent animals. Can you think of? Okay, an orangutan. We can teach orangutans language. We can teach it sign language, things like that. Now, we would say they're highly intelligent, but they're not rational. Well, what's the difference? Well, you could teach a, a, a chimpanzee or ape or orangutan the sign for red circle. But guess, and it could identify that and distinguish it from blue box, brown table. But guess what they can never do? They can't get this. They can get this red circle, but they can't get the circle as red. What's the difference? It's a huge jump between the two, but... This is a name. Now, you could say Gooba Gaba and, the, and identify that with the red circle. It doesn't matter the sounds that you give. For the ape or chimpanzee, that is a name. It is not a concept. And as you rightly pointed out, watch how much is involved. You have to have enough experiences of things that are circular to be able to get the idea or form imprinted on your potential intellect so that you now have the form in your mind. This is why children, small children, give them a baseball and you say ball. And watch how confused they get when the next day you give them a football and say ball. They're gonna say, it looks different. How is that possible? Then what do you do? You give them a soccer ball the next day. Ball. Now they're even more perplexed. And you give them a beach ball. Ball. You give them all these physically looking different objects by the same name. And what did Plato say? A multiplicity of things by which you give the same name is what? You're naming what? The form. At some point, that child's going to get a eureka moment. And they're going to say, aha, I've got it. You're not giving me names. I've got the idea, the one concept common among all those different, materially looking different things. I've got it. That's why it's so funny with, you start at the level almost like an animal. You're naming things. And don't you see this is why children get so mad when they're on the playground and say, Johnny, your daddy's here. And Bobby says, goes and slaps the kid and says, no, I have daddy. Well, they think daddy's unique. They don't understand that daddy is a concept, that a one among many instances. And so they get very upset and threatened by, somebody's taking my daddy. Now, that's not my daddy. That's my daddy right there. <laughs> Oh, that's interesting. So when we get into philosophy mind, we're going to get into artificial intelligence. Can machines become intelligent? Can they become conscious? And could they receive forms? Now notice, it's one thing to receive forms, but the ability to, out of many different instances, to pull out the one common thing. So you're getting the form pressed in, but that's still not even the beginning of knowledge. What you have to do is a process of called abstraction. And abstraction means to pull out. There has to be a pulling out of all those different material instances. So even if you have the form there, you're then going to have to be able to transcend the material instances 
and be able to see, I've got it, it's not a name, it's a concept. That's the first step. You're not even to knowledge yet. All you have is an idea. So first step, the form needs to be pressed on the mind. Second step, you need to do an abstraction where you lift the form out of the material instances and it, you're able to see, now I've got an idea and concept and I see what's common among many things. You have to do the same thing with all the instances of red. Then here comes the big jump that no other animal other than rational animals are able to do. The synthesis. The judgment to bring two different forms together in an act of predication. Redness belongs to the circle. That is almost an infinite jump between our closest primates. And it's absolutely amazing that we're able to not only abstract, but to form judgments. Because knowledge involves truth, and truth can only be found when you make the predication of being. The circle is being read. That's quite profound. So that's what makes us specifically unique, according to Aristotle. We are animals, but what makes us different, specifically different from the rest of the animals? Rationality, the ability to receive forms and to then abstract and then take the abstract concepts and form judgments in a synthesis called predication. Pretty amazing, isn't it? Now, Aristotle says, we've got a problem here, an aporia, because we don't have enough concepts or terminology to really get where we want to. So let's say, I don't know what this is. I can say, it's potentially known, but not actually. Not until I actually know it, correct? Then I have a potential mind that can potentially know this, but it doesn't until it actually knows it. And Aristotle says, right now we've got too much potency to equal actuality. Two potencies don't add up to an actuality. You need something actual to make what is potential into something actual. Let me give you an example. This is potentially hot, but not actual. How do I take what's potentially hot and make it actual? Do I just keep adding potentially hot things? Well, this is potentially hot, but it's not. We just put that together. Let's put some ice on it. That's potentially hot, but you need something actually hot. So what do you do? Something that's cold, but potentially hot. How do you make it actually hot? Light it on fire. Fire it up. Take something that's actually hot. What's actual makes what's potential actually hot. Aristotle uses this reasoning to say, look, there's too much potency to go around. There's a potential object that's known and a mind that's potentially capable of knowing. But you need a principle in your mind that's actuality, that can make what's potential actually known. And he says, it's similar to light. Very interesting because that sounds a bit like Plato. What is responsible for not only the being of things, but you knowing the forms? So what is responsible not only for the existence of the forms, but your ability to know them? The form of good. And the form of good, he says, is like what? What? In the cave. Light. The, yeah, light, the sun. So if we shut off the light and we sealed up so that there was no light coming in, there's a lot of objects and things around the room that are not known, but they're potentially known. 
how do I make what's potentially known actual? Flip on the light. And the light allows us to see. Do you see what I'm saying? That's why we use the, that terminology. Do you see? Because we realize that light and seeing has a link to knowledge. So he says, there is something in your mind calls an active intellect or the agent intellect that makes what's simply possible actual knowledge. And he says, the agent intellect, or in the Greek, nous poiotikos, is like light. There is something that's able to shine light on that. And he also calls nous poiotikos, or the agent intellect, is the maker mind. This is the receiver mind, but you have to have a maker mind. There's some principle in your mind that's capable of doing and making, taking forms, abstracting them, and then shining light on so that it can come together and you can make true judgments and therefore have knowledge. Isn't that interesting? So that is Aristotle's theory of epistemology, of knowledge. Okay, let's go. We talked about the notion of causality. Cause doesn't just mean push and pull. It's a, it's a type of explanation. And there's different types of explanations that you can give. A cause can be understood in this sense. It's what the effect is dependent upon. It's indebted to for its being. We talked about Aristotle says out of all the different types of explanations or indebtings that you could have, you could categorize them all into four different types of explanations or cause. Material cause. Well, what is it made out of? It's wood. Well, what is the wood made into? A desk. Okay, you name the formal cause. The formal cause answers the question, what is the matter made into? The efficient cause. Who, was the sor who or what was the source of the motion? The artist or the billiard ball or the rock falling down, that would be. And the final cause. Well, for what purpose? What purpose is the acorn seed for the next step? to grow a plant, to grow into the very end product. So you can understand the form in terms of looking at the form in its very end state. Now let me give you a little riddle. Suppose we time travel back two, three hundred years ago, and you don't have any kind of modern science available to you or scientific information. And I give you two different embryos. And I tell you, embryo one and embryo two come from two different animals. How do you tell that they're different? They look materially the same. What are they? What would you do? You could do that. You could wait. Just see what it turns into in the end. And by the way, that's also called, because end in Greek, the word is telos, where we get teleology. So something that's directed or moves or grows into its end product is teleology. So you could look at the teleology. Well, look, it turns into a bird. And then you wait, and you see that this turns into a turtle. 
you could do that. So notice that you've given one explanation. Suppose you don't want to wait around. Now you could give the material explanation. Well, what is that made out of? Well, it's made out of the same substance or the same material elements. It'd be some combination of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen in terms of modern chemistry. But that really doesn't help us because we can combine carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, form it in different ways. So that's just saying what's necessary to make that thing. Well, obviously, atoms and chemicals are, are necessary. So I've got the material cause. I could wait around to the end, the final cause, to see it. But let's say I'm impatient and I don't want to wait around. What else could I do? See what made it. Exactly. And don't you know that Aristotle actually has solved the question, which one comes first, the chicken or the egg? The chicken or the egg? Here's the mama chicken, the hen, done in Picasso-like abstract. <laughs> Sorry. I don't want to waste my time trying to get like de the details of the, hold on, just bear with me another five minutes and I'll get this chicken just right. It's like, come on, wrap it up. Okay. Well, here's the question. If the egg comes first, because remember Aristotle says, Teleology can be understood in living things is nature always acts for an end. Always or for the most part. Um, it was actually really funny because in the De Anima, he actually addresses an objection. And somebody says, well, what about the man-faced ox progeny? Doesn't that sound strange? What is a man-faced ox progeny? What is a progeny? It's an offspring. That was supposed to be an objection to, okay, smarty pants, Aristotle. If nature always acts and grows into its end, what the heck happened with this guy right here? Aristotle responds, okay, always or for the most part, things can happen. If you pour radiation over embryos in, or put radioactive materials in the Petri dish and then try to grow something, I guarantee you it's probably not going to grow into its normal end. There's going to be some problems. So Aristotle anticipates that objection and says, fine, but for the most part, notice that chicken eggs don't grow into human beings. Acorns don't grow into houses or cars or they grow into their proper end. Okay, here's the question to respond to. Let's solve the age-old problem. Which one came first, the chicken and the egg? Aristotle would say, okay, what is the egg growing into? If I tell you, meet me at Disneyland, go towards Disneyland, which one must come first? Your movement or Disneyland? Now, you can use distinctions, and you could say, yeah, that's a trick question. Can you go to Disneyland if there is no Disneyland? No. So Aristotle says, in order of time, this is first. But in terms of metaphysical reality, there has to be a place that this is moving towards. Otherwise, we'd have chicken eggs growing into all kinds of things. If there was not some end to be driving towards, i.e. Disneyland, you wouldn't be getting to Disneyland. So, what is... What do we call the final cause? It's the form. It's the same as the formal cause. Seen at the end. Because I can't see chicken in there. 
Why? Because you can't see forms. Forms are what's understood. So you have to wait till that's, well, we could, you have to wait to see the form actualize, which is actuality, but you have to see it forming the matter until the matter looks like the idea or form, just like when you're doing a sculpture. At first, you can't see what's potentially in that block of marble. It's in the artist's mind. Well, what do you have to do to see what it is? You have to actualize it. You have to wait. Why? Because the only way that you can receive forms is like the wax tablet. You have to have like knows like. Your material body and information is always encoded within matter. And so in order to abstract, you also have to have a principle of immortality because forms are immaterial. The way that you know it, through your senses. That's why Aristotle believes knowledge is a posteriori. But you have to have an immaterial principle like light. So, now here's the difference between the artist. The artist has the form in his mind and is putting it from outside into the matter. Aristotle says nature is like an artist. She's doing it herself. There's nobody carving out those trees or pulling the branches out. Nature has a principle. The form is within her. Well, where did this acorn get its form? From its parent. You just answered the efficient cause, the agent. Where did you get your form? From your parents. Which led me to make a discovery in my PhD dissertation. What is intelligent, or I shouldn't say intelligent, what is information that guides and develops living material things to grow into DNA? Then I ask the question, what is the modern scientific counterpart to Aristotle's living forms. Living forms in nature are a principle that it's information. You can't see information. You have to decode it and abstract it. But what is the living principle in there that's guiding and forming all the matter to do this? Form. So guess what the modern counterpart to Aristotle's living forms are? I discovered DNA. Now watch this. This is really cool. Suppose this is a human embryo. Father or parent one. Let's just do father and mother. Father has DNA set DNA sub one. And the mother has DNA Sub two. So our father, mother and father's DNAs, they're different, aren't, right? Why? Because one's a mother and one's a father. They look different. They're different beings. Well, since DNA is the modern counterpart to Aristotle's living forms, that means, and remember, form is what something, you don't say, well, what is it? You don't say the matter. You, you identify the form. What makes something be what it is, and what is it? It's its form. And for living things, what makes the life is the living substantial form. So what makes your father a living human being? His form. He has a common form, rational animal, but he also has a unique form that makes all his features look the way that he does. Let's call that DNA sub 1, DNA sub, or form sub 1. So in the act of conception, what do mother and father contribute? So your DNA is a combination of what? 
your mother and father's DNA. DNA, so let's say this is you. You are a combination of DNA. Now, harken back to the argument that Aristotle gave. Is the whole greater than the sum of the parts? In a way, yes. In a way, no. Are you, as a whole, greater than the sum of the parts of your parents? In a way, yes. And in a way, no. In a way, yes. Or in a way, no. Because, well, I'm materially, I have the same parts. But what happens, just like we had the example of when I have two ox hydrogens plus an oxygen, the two material parts, they come together in a substantial change to get, I get something new. New in terms of form, because the form of hydrogen is very different than the form of water, and the form of oxygen is very different than the form of water. The parts are equal. The parts on the left-hand side are equal to the parts on the right-hand side. But in terms of form, since that's a new thing, a new form, the whole is greater than the part. So in the act of conception, when your mother and father contribute the information, the DNA, they give you the material parts but you become not just simply an extension of your mother and father, you become a new form and identity, synthesizing those together. And you can't see, so Aristotle would answer, and you could see perhaps using Aristotle with contemporary biomedical ethical problems, say uh, right to life and things like this, um, how would Aristotle respond versus a materialist? Remember, Aristotle always responds in a way yes, in a way no, because that allows him to make distinctions. Is that a human being in the exact same way that you are? In a way, in a way no. Clearly a way no, because it doesn't look anything like me. In a way yes, because the same form that makes you a human being and not potentially, because forms are actuality. Once the parents contribute the genetic information, and it comes together so that... Because remember, the egg and the mother is hers. It's just a part of her body until what? Until the father contributes his information, and there's a synthesis and creation of a new entity, a new form, i.e. the act of conception. So Aristotle would say, um, contra other philosophers, of course, but Aristotle would say, no, that is a living human being, even though it doesn't look like it, because looking like it's not that important. I mean, think about if we said the man faced ox progeny, because he looks different, isn't a human being. In fact, people had said that in history. And think about all the problems. If you don't look like me, then you're not a human being. <laughs> well, clearly you're not an Aristotelian. Uh, mic drop. Okay, I win. You lose. Aristotle would say, what makes you what you are are not your physical parts, but it's the form. And what's really interesting for living things, form is the Greek word anima, like animation or anime. What is animation? What's the difference between inanimate objects and animate entities and objects? What do you think anima means? Movement. Self move. You nailed it. Perfect. God, you guys are so smart. This cannot move itself. Why? Because it's not living. It requires motion to be imparted to it from outside in. Well, surprise, surprise, with living things, they have anima. They have living 
forms. They can move, plants can move themselves. You don't have an artist going, look what I'm doing. I'm putting a form in the matter. No, it already has the form. And it's guiding itself. Anima, literally translated, is soul. It's funk soul brother is the chemical brothers. It's kind of cool, chemicals and forms and all kinds of ties together. And Aristotle says there are three types of animas or forms or souls, I mean living forms. He would say plants have soul. Why? Because they have a principle of self-motion. He identifies that, and here are the three. Types of soul. Vegetative soul, i.e. plants. Since soul or anima means a principle of self-motion, what, in what ways do plants move themselves? Growth. Photosynthesis. They're doing that on their own. That means it has a type of soul. Type. It's not like Lord of the Rings, okay, where the trees, what were the name of the trees in the Lord of the, the ants, yeah. Oh, do you? Okay, it's not like they have human souls trapped in. They have a type of anima or form appropriate to their material constituents to produce what they should in their species. The next one, which Aristotle says, has the principle of the vegetative, but even more. Sensitive soul. Animals, which you see the word anima in. Aristotle says animals can do everything plants can as far as self-motion, but much more. What can animals do? They have psychic abilities, not because they can read tarot cards and prophesy you're winning the lottery, but because they have mental faculties. Clearly, you've seen that in animals. They're not like plants. They're able to do and move themselves in different ways. They're able to sense, i.e. sensitive, not me. They have a feeling, they have consciousness, and they're able to have intellectual powers at varying levels. The final one embraces Aristotle, all the principles of nature but rises above by the possession of nous, Greek word for mind, the rational soul. That's why we're animals. We have everything plants have plus animals, but we have one specific difference. We have rationality, the ability to conceptualize, abstract, and then make decisions and deliberations, build empires, tear them down, write philosophy, literature, art, all of this, ethics, all of this implies A soul. Questions so far? Okay, let's do something. This is taken from my PhD thesis. So one of the things I talked to you about, what was I doing in my PhD thesis, is there are certain problems that arise within contemporary science, obviously, that science hasn't been able, they have arguments and can't figure things out. Um, I thought, you know, I think there's some good insights in Aristotle, but the language is disproportionate to the language we use in our contemporary scientific age. Could it be translated? I think it can. I already have shown one way. 
a modern scientist would scoff. Watch this. Also, M.C. Escher was a DJ. I'm, no, I'm joking. He was not a DJ. But he's got an MC, so you might have thought. How many people have seen this? M.C. Escher is really nice because he has some deep philosophical concepts within his art. Now, if I take one of your cells and I, and I look under a microscope and I break down the proteins, I can figure out your DNA. And your DNA is in every single cell. And what is your DNA? It's a picture of the whole developed self in its end. It is the information, the instruction manual to tell all your material parts how to organize together and how to reach its final end. So what you have in each one of your parts that makes up the whole is a picture of the whole in each and every one of the parts. M.C. Escher displays this beautifully in this piece of art. The fish is made up of scales. What do you notice in each part, each part contains the whole. Which one came first, the chicken or the, the, the chicken the f- or the fish? Why? Because in each of the parts that make up the whole, it must be directed and have an image of the whole entity that it's going to develop and grow. Isn't that fabulous and fascinating? That is uh, one of the most beautiful depictions of DNA in Mariology, which is a fancy word for whole and parts, the philosophy of whole and parts. Okay. So if we translate Aristotle's living forms into the contemporary usage of DNA... DNA is form, information. It's what makes the parts into something, like the water, new. That is not simply a heap. It's not a heap of Legos. It's not a heap of hydrogen and oxygen. It's a substantial change. It's a new substance. We can apply that now in terms of modern science to see multiple levels of reality and entities, of how parts come together in terms of form and wholes. Watch this. So this is an illustration out of my PhD thesis. If in, ter- in, in terms of modern science, what is the lowest level, re- as far down as you can go? Quarks, neutrinos. Subatomic particles. And what are subatomic particles? Well, let's apply some Aristotelian terminology and see if we can clarify this. If we understand matter is what something's made out of or potentially organized into, so if I had a bunch of wood, what is wood? Potentially, I can organize it into a table, the idea or form of table. What happens if I take an electron, a subatomic particle, and I give it some organization around a nucleus? Yeah, specifically, hydrogen. So notice how subatomic particles stand to atoms. Atoms are simply not a heap of parts. It's a substantial change. So you can understand that in terms of form and matter. Let me see. I think I have a slide from...
a lecture I gave on evolution. Well, I got to spell evolution correct first. Oh no, hit the wrong one. This one, ah! Yeah, here we go. So do you see how these parts, so here you get subatomic particles being organized into a new substance, and then you can, uh, atom, then you can see how these atoms come together to form water, a chemical, Okay, chemicals are matter for amino acids. So we could take H2O, ammonia, and meth. So what do they do? They give them abbreviated letters. A, G, um, where's our C? C, T, Now, what happens if I take amino acids? Now, let me give you, let me just pause there and give you an analogy in terms of matter and form. What makes up words? Letters. Now, if I just put them randomly together, does that mean anything to you? Yeah. That's just random nonsense. Okay? There is no idea that I can communicate, but what happens if I organize that into an idea? If I encode information into the material parts? Can you get a message that you want to Mop. I know what a mop is. Now, guess what? The matter organized into a form, an idea that you recognize. Now, can't I take words is matter? And I could say, mop dog espresso door. And you say, uh oh, professor's having a stroke again. Okay. But I could organize those in, after you drink the espresso, mop up the floor and get out of the door. That is a coherent idea, as strange as that might sound. Well, what have I done? I've taken words as material parts and organized them into form, an idea, at a higher level of information. Now more information is communicated in a sentence than there is in a word. And I can keep going with this. I can take sentences and make paragraphs, paragraphs into chapters, and chapters into volumes. There is an analogy here. Just as atoms are to letters, so are the words to the sentences in the same way that I can take the chemicals and each level that I organize the parts into displays a higher level of information, doesn't it? So what did we start with? Subatomic particles. They would be something like the letters. I organize it. That would be analogous to a word with more information in it. I take the words together and I organize them into amino acids and amino acids into proteins, protein strands. And with DNA, the way that I organize is not random or the way that nature is doing it. It takes a protein, sorry, amino acid, A, C, 
T, the way that it's stacked is communicating information the way that you'd be stacking paragraphs. Then the problem is I've already exhausted two dimensions, one going this way and one going up. I need another set of another level of information. How do I do it? So I've stacked my A, G, C, T, A, okay, and I've organized it so that there's information, there's intelligibility there. What's another way that I could communicate information? This is two dimensions, one dimension going up and one going across. Three dimensions. Spin it. I've now created a volume, sets of volumes. And all of that is encoded in your matter and it's guiding and developing into what you're going to become. So do you see that Aristotle can be quite beneficial if translated into modern science? And their levels of information. You know, even in records, how many people like vinyl? Isn't it strange that all information, we can't really do telekinesis. I can't say, do you know what I'm saying? Do you know what I'm thinking? Uh, no, I have to encode the information into a tangible means that can be delivered to you. Well, aren't vinyls the same way? We could have a whole song or a speech, but it has to be encoded in something. And what it's encoded in doesn't have to look like the ideas. That's why vinyl has grooves. Those grooves look nothing like the word apple or tree or anything like that. It doesn't matter because it's encoded in matter but you need another material, the needle, where each little groove is sending a vibration in different patterns. And what's really interesting, Aristotle calls form pattern. What makes, if we had checkers or something like that, what makes that not random, but a, a recognizable pattern, the form that you put all the material parts into. Well, nature and human beings do the same thing. If you organize this pattern in an intelligible way and then make something to decode it, so that vibration comes here in the same pattern that's going over the grooves and it's connected to a speaker and a speaker is a, a, a form of amplifier where then, boom, 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 sound waves. Then you have an ear here with a little eardrum, boom, 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 boom. And then it goes onto your top of the raza, and you have a form, and oh my gosh, what beautiful music. Isn't that amazing that we can explain all of that in terms of, here's a synthesis of modern science and Aristotle that I think both can be mutually complementary. What do you guys think? Good.
Sky.